Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving, and a special welcome to the guests with us who are here with us this morning. Uh, just a few announcements before we get into the uh, of our worship. And they're up here on the main board. So, hello to all our online viewers, those who will see this uh, worship service later on on YouTube. Oh yes, this is really important. Eva left today for her mission trip to Tanzania, so we need to remember to pray for her, for her safety, and just that everything goes well for her, and that she has a real good impact while she's there. That's pretty straightforward. If you're interested in membership, you can speak to me. Oh, yes, the Caribbean Workers Outreach Committee is looking for uh, volunteers to serve on their steering committee. If you are at all interested in that work, you know, they want to get ready for that for next year. Uh, maybe they will be doing some new things next year. So, if you're interested, speak to Mark or Diane.
And the new project coming out is perhaps not the premature. So you understand that the backers deny it. I have no idea what it was, but I now know that premature babies have a very much higher chance of uh, retinal problems. If they're diagnosed within two to three weeks, their sight will be safe. If they're not, it's too bad. Being a third party in the and being blind is not fun uh, for anybody. But anyway, so this is a project that will be going on in the next many, many months. This time of the year, we use that direction uh, in the community and in this church. We for five years had banquets. And uh, they were interesting to do with a lot of fun, a lot of work. But then COVID came, and then COVID came, and then COVID came, and so now we have nothing to bank with. We're just doing the collection. So that's one. The next one is carrying company. Over here, you see the box. More than 30 years ago, under the title of the school, uh, carrying company got established by this church and two other churches in Sinko, and it's still running well. I'm your representative on the board of directors for that. And we serve uh, and help over 100 families every month in many, many ways. So that's a part of that. So if you want to bring your things in here, they'll be taken over to the caring government on a regular basis. The last one goes for kids. The last one is for the collection now. Uh, for over 30 years, those for kids and now those for kids and adults has gone on in this church. The Rotary Club is the one that organizes it. And then in the past, Barbara, Bob Darby, and Virgil Cleaners were the ones who generously gathered the goats, cleaned the goats, mended the goats, put on the buttons, fixed the zippers, and then brought them to be here. So at the end of December, it was the 28th, and here, in our gymnasium, the name of our church, we had in the space, uh, working with fearless cleaners, now groups with fearless cleaners taking over the Virgil's clothes. So if you bring your coats in, I'll make the arrangements for them to be taken care of. So you want to run a um, uh, fearless on um, Thomas Street? Head Street. Head Street, okay. It's a little every hundred years. Anyway, uh, so that's fine. So these are three things. It's interesting, this church is an extremely dynamic church. And I remember in the past when that one the person was complaining that we don't do enough. And I said, well, I think if you ever took the time to check it out, you'd find it pretty accurate. Uh, the person kept saying, we're not doing enough. Person who didn't want to go and do it. So I find that we are involved in over 30 organizations and activities in this community. So whether it's uh, Caribbean Outreach, it's up here at the Pregnancy Center, we've been collecting for that for years, Church of Serving, First Serving, all of these are activities that are supported by this congregation. All of these are part of that meaningful thing. For some of you who are old enough to remember Agnes C, one of the things she taught, she was our director of Christian education many years ago. Um, some people are so busy singing and praising uh, you know, other people than me, they are no earthly good. And I think this church can do both. It can be singing and praising and blah, blah, blah. But it can also be not just about to do different things to make this community better. And I think that's what makes this church an interesting church, a dynamic church. Let's pray together. The Lord God, He creates us in your image and makes us stewards of the good earth. We marvel at the trust you place in us. Despite the depths to which we sometimes descend, we know that we are meant for heights. Despite our crucifixion of the earth, we know it was made for resurrection. Be with us, O oh Lord. Help us to reclaim the image in which you make us and to new year
join me for our little. In the morning, God plants the roots of the trees. In the evening, the Lord inspects the harvest. The Lord looks for justice. The Lord looks for righteousness. The Lord longs for righteousness. God is good, and out of his goodness, he binds up the wounds of the afflicted. In recognition of God's eternal goodness, we now offer our gifts to him in prayer. We pray that God will use our offerings to heal those who are suffering, shelter the homeless, to comfort the lonely, and make whole once again those whose lives have been broken. We give what we have in the name of Christ Jesus. Who gives us all the gift of hope. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, we pray that you will help us to be a grateful people. You will remind us regularly of the wonderful gifts that you have bestowed upon us. And help us, O oh God, to give thanks in all things. We offer these gifts, Father as a token of our appreciation and our commitment to your work in this community and the Christ our Lord.
God was close. That sounds like last week. I feel like I'm going to my lights on. Is it the same thing we did last week? You get 
presents on Thanksgiving. Good for you. I, I never go to your house. You're getting a late birthday present. What else do you like about Thanksgiving? I know one thing all these bridge grandkids should like. You get to be together as a family. Look at you all. My goodness, go forth and multiply. <laughs> <laughs> they took it hard. That's right. It could be a while. But we have time with family. We get a little extra break. If you're at school, you get Monday off, right? Some of you are getting Monday off. Now, Melody will like this most of all, but maybe all. I found somebody who really doesn't like Thanksgiving, hates it, would rather we just forget all about Thanksgiving. And, and I couldn't bring this person today, but I brought a picture of him that Laura found. I remember Laura, she's behind me. And uh, here's the, I call him, his name is Giblet. That's, the, that's, that's someone who doesn't like Thanksgiving at all. It's a turkey. Yeah, it's not, Thanksgiving is the kind of the turkeys, I guess. But we, we can enjoy Thanksgiving. We can give thanks for all the things in our lives. So let's give God thanks now for everything. Let's pray again. Dear God, we thank you for everything. The good, the bad, everything. We thank you that we have so much to enjoy and so much to learn. And we just offer it all to you with gratitude. Christ, amen. Okay, Pikachu, you can leave the money.
morning. That was beautiful music. Thank you so much. Wonderful to have you back there. It really was. It's nice to have voices behind you for some of the time. It's wonderful. Our, our New Testament lesson today is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 1 to 9. Philippians 4, 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Dia, and I urge Cynthia to be of the same mind in, in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made, made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the Lord, word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Giving thanks in all things. Really? I don't know why, but this is the second week with a golf story, and I don't even play. I don't know why I keep doing that. There was a, a foursome of senior golfers who hit the course, and they used to play together for years, almost every week they could. But as the years progressed, their enthusiasm for the sport began to kind of wane. One man said, Boy, I don't know about you, but these fairways are getting longer and longer. Another one said, and these hills, my goodness, they're getting steeper as the years go by. Another complained, the sand traps seem bigger than I remember them do. Finally, listening to his three other friends, the oldest and wisest of the four of them, who happened to be 87 years old, piped up and said to the other men, oh my friends. Just be thankful we're on this side of the grass. <laughs> the most important attitude that we can ever nurture in ourselves, that we can ever exhibit, is the attitude of thanksgiving or gratefulness. However, I may be convicted by Scripture of this fact, but given current circumstances in recent and perhaps ongoing pandemics, I find cultivating Thanksgiving extremely difficult. All of us may have been hard-pressed of late to be very thankful on this special holiday. However, everything we know and experience tells us that the attitude of thankfulness makes significant difference in our state of mind and our attitude. Personally, the last few years for me have been quite traumatic and difficult. Many days I have spent in uncertainty and fear. When someone says to me to give thanks in all things, even if it's the Apostle Paul, I reply, really? How can you suggest a thing like that, Paul, when you yourself, when you wrote this, were in prison? Not just any person either. He was in a Roman prison. Hmm. These prison facilities were little more than underground caves that were accessed by really just a manhole-sized entrance. These were horrible, dark, damp places. They were often extremely crowded. It was so dark, likely, down in that prison that Paul likely had to dictate his letter because he couldn't see well enough to even write. Still in this miserable place, 
Paul in his letters to the Philippians says, make your petitions known. Pray to God for what concerns you, what troubles you, what you desire, but in everything give thanks. Left to our own devices, being thankful and offering thanks to God in all things seems impossible, right? However, if we are able, by the grace of God, to cultivate that attitude of thanksgiving in what we do say and are about, Paul is telling us that we will know a life that is at once more challenging, but at the same time, more fulfilling. This call to thanksgiving in all things does not permit twisting our words to simply appear like we're being thankful when we're not. <laughs> I saw a, a cartoon not long ago. It was a family gathered around the, the family dinner table for the common dinner or the common meal. And the father said to the mother, Now, I don't want to complain about leftovers, but haven't we already said grace over this meal three times? <laughs> He didn't want to complain, he said. He didn't want to complain about leftovers. But what did he do? Complain. He wanted to give thanks in all things, but he found it really difficult to do. That's a great challenge before us today. Frankly, it's a great challenge every day. But it's also an opportunity that we have to give thanks in all things. I was beginning to think that maybe it would be helpful if we categorized our thanksgiving. First we start, we say, we'll give thanks to all things that are obvious to us. So what does that mean? All of us know that there are some good things so close to home, so obvious to us, that we forget sometimes to give thanks for We would say that we take those things for granted. And all of us know of what I speak. Instead of being thankful of routine gestures of care from our spouses, from our parents, or from other people, we just kind of expect them. It's no wonder when our, our children, a lot of children today, it's great. When children are given something, what do we say to the little children? Now, what do you say? Or when they pester us for a cookie or something else, we say, what's the magic word? I've never been a fan of that one, mostly because of the word magic in there. So Paul begins his letter by saying, at every remembrance of you, or every time I think of you, I give thanks for you. The next time you recognize the following thought in your mind, or you hear it said aloud, stop and take notice. It goes without saying. When it comes to Thanksgiving, it does not go without saying. You, you remember that wonderful story of the ten lepers that were healed by Jesus. Remember that story? Very popular story. And at the end of the story, the nine, the ten were healed, nine went their own way, right? And only one came back to Jesus. And that one that came back was a Samaritan of all things. And he knew in his heart that it doesn't go without saying. The first opportunity of giving thanks in all things, and thus changing our attitude and our lives, is to give thanks for the obvious things in our lives. These are the people, the other blessings, so close to us that, well, sometimes we look right past them. You know, several of us were raised in very stoic circumstances. We were encouraged to hide our emotions, weren't we? Big boys don't cry. We've heard that a lot. Some of us know people who struggle or absolutely refuse to express their feelings openly or freely. The story goes there was a farmer who loved his wife and appreciated her so much that one day he almost told her so. Almost. It's how we often attempt thankfulness. Almost. It's the way we are sometimes. 
It's so obvious that we forget. The psalmist says we are to thank God for God's benefits. Just think for a moment the benefit of being right here right now. Not just being in this building, but being alive. As, as alive people, we can laugh, we can sing, we can cry, we can go to the fair if we want to buy one of those pictures you have. These benefits are a part of God's wonderful love for us. One of the greatest benefits of being fully alive is to give thanks to God for all his benefits. So what benefits go unnoticed because they're too obvious? You know, <laughs> somebody's happy. Oh, God, I'm here. <laughs> As we know many children, that it would be great to ask the children sometime, you can do that with all the children who are here, have you ever given thanks for the miracle of your body? There was a great architect one time who said that there's been no invention in the world like the creation of the human hand. It's true. Children, that includes all of you, have you ever noticed your noses lately? Suppose that your nose was on upside down. Every time you sneeze, you blow your head off. nose was upside down when it rained the ground. Now that sounds silly, doesn't it? But you know what I think is even sillier? Forgetting to give thanks to God who created this marvelous miracle called our body. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are. Although we are wonderfully made, we're too small to cling to all the thankfulness that wells up in us. When we want to thank God, it spills over. And we begin thanking other people, don't we? When we're truly thankful to God, we begin to thank people for what they've meant to us over the years. Or maybe just one day. You know, I really appreciate it. Really appreciate you. You heard that? Right? Thanksgiving, it is not a time of the year, but an attitude of the heart. It's an attitude that changes people. So we give thanks for all things obvious. We might also encourage each other to thank God for those things that are obscure. Obscure. What does Daryl mean by that? It means blessing and opportunities that are kind of hidden to us. People that we don't see right away helping us. Things that seem of little value until we take a closer look at them. In this passage, Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, of good report or gracious, think on these things. It means to calculate, to stop and ponder. Think about them for a while and begin to see that these things that were obscure to us could be beyond our calendar. Give thanks for those things that are true. That word is a wonderful word, isn't it? It means not only that those things which are true in terms of telling the truth or honest speaking, but also those things that we like to say have lasting substance to them. It, it's, it's something that just doesn't flit away. It's something that's here today and gone tomorrow, but the enduring things of life. To give thanks for friendships that don't just go away in a tough time. To give thanks for a marriage that really has gone through better or worse. There, there was a conference years ago where the president of Princeton Seminary was the speaker. His daughter came to him one day and said to him, I've looked around 
and there just aren't any good marriages. I'm so discouraged. I don't want to get married. Now, I've heard that myself several times. And I have to admit, I can see how some of them think that's true. But I love this, the father's response to his daughter. He said, I'll tell you one marriage that's good. It's the marriage of your mother and I. And she said, oh, that doesn't count. And he said, it counts. And that's what I want to say, it counts. It counts to give thanks for those things that are true and those things that endure. Paul says, whatever things are lovely, think on those things. This suggests that whenever people are lovable and amiable, we'll give thanks for them. You know, there's a famous psychologist I read some time ago who said that some people in this world, and I know you know this, there are some people in this world who are not just people. There are people who almost make us physically sick because they're always negative. They're always pointing out our foibles. They're always pointing out inconsistencies and the things we've done wrong. They're toxic. But he said there's also in our life nourishing people. Give thanks for those who nourish you. People who feed you. People who are part of God's gracious plan to build you up. Whatever things are of good report, whatever things are valuable, give thanks for those things. Even though you can't see the value at first, meditate, calculate, reckon, think on them, and they become clearer to you. Even those things that are obscure, give thanks. This last one's the hardest thing. In all things objectionable, give thanks. I, I deliberately save the toughest for last, and you know it. In all things objectionable, give thanks. This is the one with which many of us in this room have been dealing with recently. And that's certainly been true for me in the last few years. It, it's really hard to be thankful when you're ravaged by an infection. Lying in a hospital bed or undergoing major surgery. How do you give thanks in the midst of that? Paul says we're to give thanks in all things. Not, not some things. It's not what he said. He said give thanks in all things. Not just the pleasant and the good, but the bad and the difficult too. Do you mean to say I am to give thanks for this tough patch in my life that I'm going through? Am I supposed to give thanks for this thorn in the flesh which doesn't seem to be taken from me? That's a tough one, isn't it? But if we are to have an attitude of thanks that can transform the situation, we are to give thanks in all things, even if they're objectionable. Quite naturally, you may say, ah, I'm not going to give thanks for this illness. Or, I'm not going to give thanks for what that person has done to me. Then at least start here. Give thanks for the presence of God in that situation. That God's not left you. Even though you had a setback in life, God is still present and is still willing to redeem that situation. Then there's the next step. Begin to realize that even though through the worst circumstances, God can work something wonderful. Isn't the risen living Christ the great reminder that even the evil of the cross can be transformed into new and exalted life? I, I, I've probably told you this story before, but it's one of my favorite stories from the life of Corey Ted Boom. Uh, I, as a kid, I read her book, The Hiding Place, I don't know how many times. It was read by millions of people around the world. Uh, she died many years ago, um, but she served the Lord her whole life. And what a remarkable and gracious lady she was. And if you know the story, she and her family lived in the Nazi Holocaust in, in 
fallen. They hid, hid Jewish people in their home who would otherwise have been taken off to concentration camps and killed. Their act of compassion for Jewish neighbors led them all in jail. Eventually, they all went to a concentration camp. In fact, their parents didn't survive it. But when Corey was in a Nazi prison camp, it was such a flea-ridden, terrible place that she was just going to go insane. It was driving her nuts. Her older sister, Betsy, said, but I found something in the Bible that will help us. It says, in all things, give thanks. And Corey said, I can't give thanks for the fleas. Betsy said, give thanks that we're together. Most families have been split up. Corey thought, oh, I, I can do that. Her sister continued, give thanks that somehow the guards did not check our belongings carefully enough, and we got this Bible in here. Give thanks for that. But Corey would not even think of giving thanks for the fleas. Later, they found out that the only reason that they and other women were not molested and harmed by the guards was because their captors were so repulsed by the fleas that they wouldn't go into bunkhouses. Give thanks even for those lowly creatures. In the town of Enterprise, Alabama, there's a monument in the middle of the town, the town square. And you probably think, well, it's got to be that of a Confederate general or something like that. No, it's not. It's a monument to all things a bull wound. There it is. The bull weevil is an animal, it's actually an insect, and it's notorious for destroying cotton crops. The town depended on the cotton. In 1915, a bull weevil infestation destroyed almost all the cotton in that town. But through this terrible ordeal, they learned the importance of diversifying their agriculture. They learned instead to plant peanuts, they planted corn, they planted other crops, they rotated crops. In two years, they erected a monument to the bull weevil. To be a reminder that through a terrible event, good things can come to their town. The Old Testament patriarch Joseph said to his brothers, who sold them into slavery and would have killed him, You meant this to be for evil, but God meant it. Isn't that was his moment to the power, moment to express his thanksgiving to God, who brought good out of such a parent. And now the story for a great of a great one teacher. Sure knows about this. Mrs. Klein told her student, her grad first graders, to draw a picture of something they were thankful for, probably a Thanksgiving project. And she thought how little children would come up with something simple, like maybe something from their neighborhood, although it was a deteriorating neighborhood, a poorer neighborhood. She knew that most of the classes would probably draw pictures of turkeys or a bountifully laden Thanksgiving tables. That's what they believed was expected of. What took Mrs. Klein aback was Douglas's. Douglas was such a forlorn and likely neglected child that often when they went out for recess, he would kind of hide in the shadow while they were in the playground. Never went out and played with the other kid. And Douglas's drawing was simply this it was a hand. But whose hand? And as the other children looked at it, they became kind of captivated by this image, and they all began to speculate as to what it meant. I think it must be the hand of God that brings us food, one child said. It's a hand of a farmer, another said, because they, they grow the turkeys for us. It looks more like a policeman than a 
protect us, our child said. That was supposed to be the hands that help us. The Douglas can only draw one of those hands, so they kind of represent everyone, one of the children said. And in all of this, Mrs. Klein had actually forgotten Douglas because the class was being so responsive and so interactive about this picture. So she bent over and she asked the Douglas, whose hand is that? And Douglas mumbled, it's yours, teacher. And then Mrs. Klein realized that she had often taken Douglas by the hand from time to time. And she often did that with the children, that it would mean so much to Douglas that he'd draw that picture. I got news for you. We all got a hand in you now. Did you know that? God can use even the worst of our circumstances in this fallen world to bring about the best for us. You know why we can believe that? Because God certainly did not want his son to die on the cross, but when it was necessary, this despised instrument of death became the way that we would come to know God. The cross became how we can give thanks in all things. Those things that are obvious, those things that are obscure, even those things that are objectionable. Everything, therefore, I say to you, Give that. Let us pray. It's a delightful hymn, O Lord, where we sing of plowing the fields and scattering the seeds, but these are not familiar activities for most of us. Those in the urban area are a little removed from the agricultural pursuits of dependence of time. But we know in our hearts that every bite of food that we enjoy has come from some farm and some corner of the road. We thank you, gracious God, for the bounty that we enjoy. Thank you for the men and the women who toil long hours to provide us the fuel we need to sustain our bodies. Thank you for the men and women who process, transport, distribute, and retail our food. It's stunning and amazing how complex our food industry has become. And yet at the same time, how far removed we are from the place our food comes from. Let us never take for granted your kindness, O God, in pouring out such a bounty upon especially when there are so many people in this world who are never sure day to day if they'll even have anything to eat. Food security is such a challenge for so many people, oh God. And we ask you to provide as only you can to those that need the bread to eat and the clean water to drink. Thank you, oh God, for the organizations that serve the poor and the hungry in this community and around the world. We thank you for the shared way, world vision, caring cover, first serving, church out serving, and so many other groups. And Father, as we heard from John this morning, we are grateful that you have made us willing partners with them and offering our bounty to help them to save lives. We thank you, Father, for modern medicine that preserves our health and how stunning the advances in medicine have been with medications and technology to treat what just a few years ago were, was untreatable. Thank you for the researchers who strive to end the suffering of the ill, the doctors and the lab technicians who diagnose, and the nurses and the personal care workers who bring comfort to meet the immediate needs of the vulnerable. Thank you also for chaplains, family members who sit by bedsides, those who journey with us through, those who journey with those whose strength is gone, who need a reassurance. But Father, we are aware today that for every extra, 
CAT scan that happens daily in our, our community and beyond. There are people in this world who struggle in other countries with parasites and diseases that are unknown to us because of inferior water and sanitation. Again, oh God, we thank you for those ministries that go to the very worst places on earth to bring hope and to bring relief to suffering. Thank you, oh God, for the precious men and women who seek to mend the brokenhearted, to overcome, help those overcome by fractured minds and souls. And we may call them counselors or therapists or doctors and ministers, but they are really your gift and special. Bless these special people as they guide, comfort, challenge, and preserve or persevere with the ones whose wounds are not evident to our eyes. This is but a small list of the many ways you have cared and provided for us, O God. Thank you for the way you shower your blessings down upon us. This morning, Father, we are mindful there are some that are near and dear to us who are struggling today. In particular, Father, we lift up our sister Betty to you. And we are distressed by the fact that she was hit by the car. We are grateful that she is in good care. We ask that you would extend your comfort and your peace and your protection on her as she awaits surgery and then eventually come home and heal and be restored. Be with her family, O God. To watch over her and support her. Father, this morning we are also mindful that this world is not a place of peace. And as violence has broken out in Israel, it continues in Ukraine. We pray, Father, for so many people that have been injured or killed, families displaced, buildings destroyed. It's such a scary thing. Oh God, we need peace in this world. And now, Father, we thank you again for your love for us, the way you walk with us, and you encourage us. And we offer our lives and our prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together still. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And leave us not to the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power of the Lord. Stand as we sing our final hymn, Holy Forever.
hands with harvest. Now fill our hearts with generous care. That as we remember what you do for us in the yield of our lands, we will ponder what we can do for you through the labor of our hands. 